be a topic a lot of people find very compelling, and it certainly uh, given us a lot of opportunity for some research and taken us in a lot of different directions. I'm really happy to have uh, today here with uh, with me uh, John Woods, who uh, was the uh, re lead researcher and writer for our uh, online exhibit, Land of Thundering Snow, and uh, is extremely knowledgeable about the terrain in Rogers Pass and about the avalanche and avalanche research. So uh, we're going to do a bit of a tag team today and delve into this topic. So of course today is the actual 110th anniversary of the snow slide, March 4th, 1910. And uh, we'll be getting into that as we go along. So uh, John, if you wanted to start. Okay, well, um, hello everybody. I know lots of faces in the audience and there's new faces, which is always great as well. So. I'm glad you were able to turn out. <clears throat> Before we uh, get into some of the details of the slide um, itself, I want to make sure everybody knows where this happened. <coughs> I don't know about you, but, um, well, I guess some of you were born here, so the mountains on this complexity was always there in front of you. But it uh, took uh, Marcy and I a while when we arrived here in 1975 to just know where people were talking about when they're mm. saying places in Rogers Pass. It's a confusing landscape. So knowing where you are is, uh, is a challenge, but it's quite important, especially when we're talking about major events, like the largest uh, loss of life in a single avalanche in Canadian history. So my uh, bet is that everybody here today has actually been at the exact site of the 1910 slide. So we'll, uh, we'll see if that's true. So is there anyone here who has never driven between Revelstoke and Golden? <laughs> okay, so I'm right. You have all been exactly on the spot. But where is the spot between these, this, these places? So a little bit of a geography here. Um, you can stare at, at this, and I'll tell you why we got this up in a minute. But uh, if this side is Salmon Arm, and, and this side is, is Revelstoke, of course, we have three passes making our way across the mountains. Eagle Pass, Rogers Pass, Kicking Horse Pass. Revelstoke and Golden are either, either side of Rogers Pass. So if we leave town here and head east, we go up into Mount Revelstoke Park, we generally climb the mountains on the highway, go into Glacier Park, and then come to, come to a summit at the top of Rogers Pass, and there's a viewpoint there. And I'll show you pictures of the viewpoint in a minute. Is there everybody, anybody who has never been by that viewpoint or know that they've been to that viewpoint? Literally the highest point on the road before you drop down after you pass that point, you start going down towards Golden. You go by the Rogers Pass Center and then the f five snowshoes in the snow sheds in the pass, down to the Beaver Valley and out and around to Golden. So, Revelstoke, Golden, the summit of Rogers Pass, the highest point on the highway. There's a viewpoint. That's exactly where it happened. So, if you can think of the there's wooden arches, and we'll show that in a minute. Oh, here we go. Captain's ahead of me. So this is the spot. Um, you can go there today, and it is not at the Rogers Pass Center. It is at the actual geographical summit of Rogers Pass. Now, if we go back one, Kathy, why did I make that point? When Marcy and I arrived here in 75, we hiked all the trails <laughs> we could, and we looked at all the interpretive signs, and this sign was three kilometers away from the actual summit of the pass. And it was about, and it basically said, in 1910, 62 men lost their lives at this point, near this point. Well, the sign was at that point, but this is nothing to do with where the men died. This is another picture that was taken at the time and mistakenly has become associated with where the event happened. And all the park staff, when I arrived in 75, this was accepted, that's where it happened. 
three kilometers away from where it actually happened. Now, <clears throat> what happened, and, and so I thought, well, these people know what they're talking about. Something to never assume for, <laughs> for anyone. And uh, I went, was going, this is a, a bit of a side story, but it, it's relevant, I think. So one day I was sitting in the park office here, thinking this is where the disaster happened. And um, the secretary said, this guy at the, at, the, uh, at the front desk, and he has some things he'd like to give you. Oh, send them down, you know, sure. He has some old pictures. So he digs out these pictures. This fellow was in his late 60s, and he said he's from Vancouver, and his wife was making him clean out the basement. Now that he had all this time, he retired. Maybe some of you can relate with that. So he was cleaning out the basement. He had to get rid of stuff. And he found these old <coughs> negatives. And the old negatives had, were pictures of them recovering bodies from the Rogers 10 slide. So then I held them up to the light and kind of went, oh, wow, this isn't there. And so I phoned up uh, Fred Schleiss, who was the head of the avalanche control at the time, because, of course, the avalanche control are interested in all these things. And I said, you've got to come to the pass with me. We'll make some prints. So we went to the pass, and we took this collection of photographs that we had enlargements made. And we realized that the actual location was where I told you it is, right at the summit of the pass. Uh, why it was of big interest to us, and it was obviously these things are of interest to the avalanche community, but we were planning to build the Rogers Pass Center at that exact spot. Not a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and it changed our course of thinking. Um, then fast forward to about 2004, 2005, one March like this, I think it was, you timed it, uh, Kathy always times these things remarkably well with, with when things, uh, you know, commemorative dates, I open up, I can remember opening up the newspaper and going, that's the wrong Kathy's article, which was wonderful, but the photograph was this photograph. So I'd never met Kathy. So I phone Kathy up and say, uh, hey, great article. That picture isn't anything to do with the actual slide. <laughs> Roger's <laughs> pass. Um, and of course, Kathy said, prove it. <laughs> Not that rude. <laughs> <laughs> Nevertheless, the intent was there. <laughs> yeah. lay, your, lay your evidence on the table, lad. We just don't accept phone in changes to our history. <laughs> so, uh, armed with maps, plans, and whatever else, um, we laid them out on the table downstairs, all these photographs, and worked all through it. And you agree? I sure did. Yeah, <laughs> which is, so, which is, which is wonderful. And now Kathy, ever since, has been um, a defender of where this actually happened, right? Um, but it's been hard. This just came out. I <laughs> think right. Yeah. All right. Oh. That looks yeah. a lot like that, doesn't yeah. it? So um, this this issue of where it happened. Uh, remains remains to be um, there because photographs have got uh, put into archives and other places labeled 1910 slide when they really were pictures that were taken uh, around the time of the slide but not of the slide itself. John, may I, yeah. may I ask what shed that is? Yes, yeah. that, okay, this is uh, when you're going down from the Rogers Pass Center, there's, four, there's uh, the first um, highway snowshed, okay? I mean, it's it's immediate going towards gold, oh, downhill. Yeah. The very first highway shed, it's just uphill from there, just before you get there, and there's a picnic area. Is that picnic area still functional? No. <coughs> there was a picnic area, tractor sheds picnic area, and the picture was perfectly situated for, uh, but this picture is of that spot, uh -huh. but this spot isn't where the people uh, passed away. Yeah. Um, this is a photograph that was taken within a day or two afterwards. Yes, probably there was another slide that came down at that site on March 5th. So this is the March 5th slide. And they're just uh, clearing the track. All right. So um, now 
We'll go back to is this. Is tunnel in the, the Go ahead. Is that a tunnel? No chance of What it is, can we go back? Now remember, this isn't the 1910. <laughs> this was a, a slide in 1910. This is a valley, a valley snow shed, so there's different si uh, types of snow sheds. This one was built so that avalanches could heat, hit it from either side. Okay, as, a, as opposed to the highway ones we have now, they're all straight shed type snow sheds. There's three provincial ones on the Klein to Rogers Pass and five national park ones on the far side. That isn't the design of this one. This one literally assumes that it could be hit, hit from either end. And was there not a snow clearing device on the train that could be used at that time? Like, how come there's so many people? Um, because this kind of slide uh, carried down a lot of trees, the magnitude of it, and these people are in there uh, very likely clearing out all the debris before the rotary plow could come through. We'll, we'll see what happens uh, in a minute. Okay, so this is, this is the spot. So the next time you're at Rogers Pass and you go there, um, take a look in both directions. Now, this is the summit of Rogers Pass, and it's confusing because yeah. the pass winds around, so it's very easy to get disoriented. But from this angle, so the highway is going this way, and that is the route when the railway went over Rogers Pass, the railway went basically where the highway is. And right where all these people are would have been train tracks in the end of one of the snow sheds that was up there. All right? And then this way, okay, so if that's looking up and down the highway, this way on one side is Mount Cheops. And on the other side, Mount McDonald and the shoulder of um, Avalanche Mountain. So you are at the base of a very narrow valley. And the story that happened then... Um, up to the slide, is that, first of all, uh, this area was uh, in the tail end of a superstorm of, of uh, weather coming in off the Pacific, and it was a, basically a 10-day snowstorm <coughs> that was uh, wrecking havoc uh, all over the Pacific Northwest. And it was setting off avalanches and killing people uh, starting February 24th, and with time it proceeded to the west and different waves of this same superstorm super came through and uh, on the evening of you know on the afternoon of March 4th uh, 1910 a slide came down Mount Cheops and blocked the tracks here a work train was sent out from Revelstoke with men to clear the track and they cleared the track they were clearing the track and when another slide, to make the story short, and you can see this an avalanche path here, came down and killed them while it hit them and killed most of them while they worked. All right, and that was the well, that sign I think I told you said 62. The other part of this that we had to figure out was how many really were involved. <clears throat> but 58 men lost their well, lost their lives. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, the the, the whole number uh, that continues to be out there. The number sixty-two continues to be out there. Uh, I'll show you the newspaper article, the front page of the local newspaper in a minute, and it says seventy-five. Some of the notes to the uh, that some of the um, uh, telegrams that were being sent said up to a hundred. So the number at the very beginning was a little bit nobody really knew. But after they had done the work, done the, the clearing, recovered the bodies, checked all the, the records of who had been working, uh, they knew that there were 58 who had died. Where the confusion came in was a little bit later, in later years, when there was um, notes of uh, bodies that hadn't been recovered. But even, those, the, even though the bodies hadn't been, rec been recovered till later, they were already accounted for. So uh, four people kind of got added to the list, uh, but those four people were already accounted for. They, the numbers are there. Um, I had some of my student researchers research this uh, exhaustively uh, about 20 years ago now, and they used all of the, um, all of the sources that they could find and uh, including the original CPR documents, which we have here. We have probably about that much material, documented material, just on this one event. All of the uh, 
correspondent, the lists of people who were being recovered, where the bodies were being sent, uh, letters to next of kin, uh, all of that. Uh, we now have it all digitized too, by the way, so it's very easy to access. But uh, through that research, we determined that the number is 58. Uh, I put the note about this uh, talk on uh, Revelstoke Community, and somebody did comment on there. I thought it was 62, so I commented. Um, so that number is out there. Uh, I believe it's still on the panel at the White Museum in Banff. Um, so that number is definitely still out there, but the correct number is 58, and we'll swear by that one. <laughs> John, if the, the number 17 shed had been in use, would this uh, scenario have occurred? Uh, it, okay, so 17 shed. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the picture, let's go back. The picture we, I was showing you there showed the shed with the men digging out. That's 14 shed. They, they numbered all the sheds. 17 shed was right where the accident happened. And the year before, in 1909, the CPR, um, this whole area was shedded, so that it was a continuous shed. So these avalanches, if the sheds held, because sometimes the avalanches were so big they damaged the sheds, uh, would have protected the trains, and there wouldn't have been a blockage, or not of this magnitude. But what happened in 1909, the railway moved, they hadn't seen any activity, and this is an important story for us. For since the railway was built, so for 25 years, they had this shed there that I guess they were starting to think it was a useless because there was never any slides. So the year before the accident, they built, they realigned the tracks over the summit of Rogers Pass, and the tracks went outside the shed. The new tracks at a little lower elevation, and that was the line that they were using. So there is some irony that all these people lost their lives right beside the defense structure that up to the year before was protecting the line. It still may have gone spilled over the edges, edges Ellen. So that's a, that's a good point. And it's a good point that 25 years is not a really good sample size. And uh, of course, as soon as we heard about, as soon as we figured out where this slide actually happened, the potential building site for the Rogers Pass Discovery Center, this was no longer on the options list. <laughs> that answer that? <clears throat> okay, we have some uh, slides now. Um, Alan and some of the rest of you can help us here. They, these are taken during the recovery and the subsequent uh, cleanup. So this event happened the actual slide that killed the man just before midnight on March 4th. So then new crews were sent up and mobilized to clear out the track and try to get the line open and of course recover the, the folks who had died. So in this picture, we're standing um, right near the end of that, the shed that was there, 17 shed. And we're looking, this is Mount Abbott. For some of those of you who know that geography, that's looking up the Sulkin uh, Pass and uh, Glick, uh, glacier crest and the Yellowstone glaciers to the left out of sight. So what you can think of is when you're driving this way from Rogers Pass back to Revelstoke, <laughs> as soon as you pass the, the wooden arches, it's quite steep going down. That's <coughs> basically where you're going in this in this photograph. You see how small the uh, fellows look there compared? Big Kathy. Now, this is a rotary engine, so this is a, a snow plow, it's a big snow bore, and it's pushed by a locomotive, so you've got this big rotary engine and then a locomotive bucking into the slide to try to clear it up after the accident. These are huge, heavy machines. Uh, this one is tossed up like a, a toy train set, set up into the debris. And it's being pushed. So this is where Mount Cheops is. So this is where the first slide came down. And then the one that caught this during the cleanout is this, this uh, coming down off of Mount Ab Abbott. And it was pushed uphill up towards Mount, Mount Cheops. Uh, anything else in here? Some of, the, some of the folks you may notice, I don't know if that's one, but we're, are wearing turbans. There was a Sikh uh, railway crew, um, work crew as part of the recovery effort. 
which is uh, which is interesting. Some of these the photographs show clearly they're, they're wearing uh, their head coverings. Okay. Ah, this is the the engine that was pushing the rotary. Um, now, Kathy knows more. Oh, back a bit. So this lady, uh, this lady here with a, with a small girl. Now, um, if there's been a, 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 a world record avalanche and death and destruction, the last thing you want is people walking around. Because what happened to these people? One avalanche came out, blocked them, and then another one came and, and killed them. But I guess they, they didn't, weren't that worried. Uh, because uh, they let passengers, a passenger train had come up. No? Go ahead. This we believe to be yeah. uh, Mrs. Dame. Oh, you know the family. actual person? Be yeah, because it, it was the, the photograph came from the Dame family. And Mrs. Dame was the wife of Joseph Dame, who was one of the roadmasters oh, who had okay. crews there. So we believe that that's her. And, and that's You her. don't think she would? Well, what happened, uh, just to, why there's some more pictures of this event, when this all happened, of course, the railway was blocked, and they had a passenger train uh, stop. And basically, the, the station there, and it's a safe station, is where the Rogers Pass Center is. Okay? So all this is going on, and there's a passenger train full of people, and that's exactly one mile from where, from where this is. So down that way, one mile, there are all these people, and some of them walked across the slopes to look at the disaster and they had little cameras. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were brownies, would they be? What? They could have been brownies. But this size of negatives, for those of you, the negatives were this big. And the passengers on that plane, on that train, took pictures. Yeah, there, there's some that did appear like in the Vancouver newspapers. Yeah. There was a man named Mr. Barraclo, uh, uh, some of his were published. So there, yes, there were. Uh, family of people that were taking photos of it unauthorized and it's one of those people who took the pictures that the guy's wife forced him to clean out of the basement and come and give to us okay so that's how this all fits together because those pictures uh we did, we're not showing them right now but they were very explicitly the right place because there were the deceased in the pictures so we knew we knew for a fact that this had to be the place, but uh, that explains how it's public. Imagine the next day, March fifth, all this has happened, and somebody didn't stop the passengers. It's non-stop avalanche path between this site and the Rogers Pass Center. It's no place that isn't an av avalanche path there. So this would be a very very unsafe thing to do, to say the least. Another one that yeah, showing another one. the clearing. The rotary. The rotary engine there. Yeah, coming into the cut. And uh, I think one of the reasons that so many people died uh, there too was because of uh, the the rotary. From that previous slide, the rotary had gone through. So a lot of the people were down in the cut, shoveling the snow off of the tracks in the cut. And that made them extremely vulnerable. Um, so this was the, the day. Um, so it was actually. As we said, the, the, um, the avalanche occurred just before midnight. The next day's paper already had the headlines, but as we said, they, the numbers weren't clear, clear yet. Uh, they had 75 men killed. But snow slide at Rogers Pass wipes out snow service crew, uh, including five CPR foremen, two engineers and conductor, four relief trains to the rescue. So immediately they, the town was uh, was mobilized. They were sending crews up uh, to, to deal with it, uh, sending out once they had uh, some of the debris cleared away and were, had done uh, rescued bodies. The rotary was able to go through afterwards. Can I ask a question? Did, after this avalanche, did they go back into the snow sheds with the trains or did they still stay in the same place? Um. I know they put the snow shed back into service, at least temporarily, but the big thing they did is a few years later, they moved the track from the surface of Rogers Pass through the Connaught Tunnel. Yeah. That's why the, mm. that's where the train is underneath now, all of this safely in the tunnel. 
There's some debate whether they did that for grade reduction or increased safety, but in fact, both resulted. Yeah. They didn't have to then climb the steep hill up over Rogers Pass. I'm just gonna show some of the documents that we have in the archives here. And so these are original reports. I didn't put it up, but we have the original telegram that was sent uh, to the, uh, the super, local superintendent at that time had been in was in Vancouver, and the uh, general manager of the district, the region, the Pacific region was in Vancouver. So this telegram was sent to them, and you can imagine how they reacted, especially when they were at that time saying that there could have been up to a hundred people killed, and uh, they listed the the uh, crews, crew bosses who had died in that as well. Uh, of course with something this serious, there was a coroner's jury held, and they did it fairly soon afterwards. They actually had a first coroner's jury on March 17th. And they weren't, at that time, they weren't able to uh, come to a, uh, uh, to a decision of, about it. Um, it said, in the newspaper, it said the coroner in summing up said the disaster seemed like an accident, pointing out that evidence showed a slide had not been known there for many years. It was no more dangerous working there that night than any other part of the road. The number of foremen killed showed it was unexpected. There is apparently no rule compelling men to work at night except an unwritten custom among the men. The jury retired and after an hour or so of discussion, failed to come to an agreement over their verdict. The jury was dismissed and they impaneled a new jury, which met on March 14th. They returned a, very, a verdict of accidental death, but they did add a rider that the CPR should refrain from working its men in snow slides on stormy nights. Uh, but there was nothing indicating that there was any uh, uh, failure on the part of the CPR. Uh, we have a, a lot of uh, correspondence uh, from uh, families in the, the records as well. This was a letter that was sent uh, by the superintendent to a woman named uh, Mrs. Moffat in Ireland, Belfast, Ireland, and uh, whose uh, son James had been lost. And then we have a couple of letters written by her uh, talking about uh, you know, how, what a difficult blow it was for the family. One of the things that uh, she said was, we would be glad of, uh, of the money as soon as you are prepared to send it to me, as my son James will be a great loss to me, for he was a good son and sent me money regular every month. He would not have left his home, only he could not get work here. He went out there and endangered his life to earn money to send me, as he knew I wanted it. Also, he knew I worked hard to raise him with a delicate father and can't get work either that he can do, and I am not able to work now as my heart is broke about my dear son cut away just in the bud of manhood, a way where I, I will never see his grave. But I hope he is in heaven, and God, I hope, will provide for me and his three little sisters and one brother. So real heartbreaking stories that's uh, in the, uh, you know, some of the material in there. Was she referring strictly to his last paycheck, or was there some compensation paid out? It would have been his last paycheck. There was no compensation made. That in some cases there was money that was in, that was considered, um, you know, like um, help if there was people in really straitened circumstances. There right. was uh, one right. elderly woman who uh, they gave some money to because her son was her sole breadwinner, and there was no. Uh, welfare at that time, uh, or pinch, public pensions. So, yeah, uh, but, if, but they did not pay compensation. Yeah, if there was negligence. It exactly. Might have been yeah, yeah, there was no compensation. And even in some of the correspondence, they're they're clear that when they are giving money, it's not compensation. They're clear that you know, that that word isn't used in terms of any money that is given. This is some correspondence regarding uh, one man who was from Wales. All of the the bodies were sent in places in Canada except for this man. His name was Ralph Hughes, and his brother Hugh also lived out uh, in here, was working in this area, and he got permission to take his brother's body home to Wales. So that was the only one that was uh, sent outside of Canada. Uh, this, uh, John was talking about the, uh, the Sikh men who were working, uh, clearing out the, 
uh, afterwards and uh, uh, recovering bodies. Uh, this is actually a letter written by uh, one of the the crew boss who was, he called himself the the Hindu boss of the the men of the gang, and uh, he's complaining about how they're being treated. Uh, he said that they were. Um, concerned about uh, it was such a bad time for the CPR and a bad time for all the men who had died and they wanted to do their bit to help but they were being treated badly and that he was going to pull his crew out of there if uh, that didn't change. So there's all these side stories, all these uh, human interest stories that were happening. I thought that you noticed, and everyone's probably seen this, there's the Italian gang so they were mm -hmm. often organized in mm -hmm. groups. Yeah and so you know, so uh, most of the men who died were Japanese, and they were part of a, a crew, a Japanese crew. So uh, here's one where you can clearly see some men with uh, turbans in the crew there. They had uh, quite a few uh, funerals in town. Fourteen of the men are buried in the Revelstoke Cemetery, uh, nine of them in the Protestant section and five in the Catholic section. There were five that were listed in the records as Austrian, but they were probably Ukrainian, either Polish or Ukrainian, based on their names, because at that time, uh, Poland and Ukraine were part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, so they were just referred to generally as, as Austrians. Um, but they had um, several funerals, and they also had a community memorial, and this was a funeral procession uh, on uh, 2nd Street West. Um, the, the little house on the corner is where the credit union is now, <laughs> oriented there. Uh, they had a memorial service on March 20th and uh, in the Opera House, which is just over on the corner of the property where the old school eatery and the uh, distillery is now, uh, fronting on 2nd Street. Uh, it's a big community gathering. Uh, interesting thing that happened there is in the memorial list, they list all the names, but they separate the Japanese mm -hmm. names from uh, from the Caucasian names. Uh, it was definitely part of uh, the, the at, at the time. The, even in in death, they were the Japanese were were separated. Um, there's um, I've heard lots of um, you know, there's so many myths that have come up around this whole story. One of the myths is that the uh, Japanese people were all buried in a mass grave in Rogers Pass. That is absolutely not true. Um, and also that they were Chinese and not Japanese. They were, we, we know of their names. We know quite a bit about them. Uh, we know in most cases when they came to Canada, who their next of kin was. Uh, thanks to research done by Tomo Fujimura, he's been able to get a lot of those personal details for the Japanese workers. Uh, uh, and we know where they're they're buried. We know exactly where they're buried. Uh, yeah. They're buried in the Mountain View Cemetery in Vancouver, mm -hmm. the majority of them. Yes, not all. Of them. The, uh, I believe that all of the Japanese men are buried in the Mountain View Cemetery in Vancouver. And there's some of the non-Japanese. Yes, there's a few there of the well. non-Japanese. We we I I've got uh, records with all of the burial places of everybody, so nobody was is unaccounted for. And Kathy, oh, you're going to fit in. You, you go ahead. Well, I was going to say, um, we'll get into some of the things that have been done during that commemoration ceremony. And one of them was uh, the creation of small bronze uh, pots, origami tr cranes, that are, are now uh, marking all of the, many of the graves were unmarked mm -hmm. the, uh, in Mountain View Cemetery and here. But all of those graves now have, a, of the Japanese men, have some form of a mark. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have a, a version of the, the marker there on the table here? Um, Just grab up while people saw you. Mountain View Cemetery participated with us uh, very heavily. They had a ceremony in Vancouver uh, just after March 4th as well. And uh, they, they made these, they made this concrete with bronze, and of course no wood frames, but they marked all the unmarked graves and put up a, a bit of a monument and they donated to Revelstoke um, mm -hmm. enough of these so that any of the unmarked graves here uh, are now marked. Mm -hmm. And that's the origami crane? Is that that's the origami. It, it's it's uh, made to look like an origami crane. You wanna, yeah. There's no reason why you can't yeah. pass yeah. that around because you can start it. Yeah. Sure. So of the, um, other than these markers, <coughs> 
there are only three of the 14 people buried in Revelstoke <laughs> who have name markers. Uh, one of them was George Nichols. Uh, there were several men who were buried beside him, but uh, it could be that over the years, either there weren't markers or they just degraded over the years. This is one of only three that's uh, still in the, in the graveyard. Uh, there were two burials in Golden, and uh, we actually have a photograph of uh, the open caskets of the two men as well. Uh, but this is the funeral of Fritz Willander and uh, Axel Johnson at Golden. And we, we have um, a profile of each of the men with any information we've been able to find on them. Uh, we usually keep it downstairs. I just brought it up here for today. You're welcome to go through there. So we've been able to compile information on most of the men who died. So this was uh, one of the Japanese funeral possessions in Vancouver. Say so that all, all of the bodies were sent there and there were Buddhist ceremonies held for all of the Japanese people. Uh, this is the funeral procession and then there's at the, the Mountain View Cemetery, the actual uh, burial. And this is a, a lot of those, the markers that were, were still there and then they've added the markers to those that didn't have them. Now, um, after Kathy and I got over the, the fact that um, it's never fun to have someone phone you up and say, hey, you put the wrong information in the paper with that photograph. <laughs> we, we buried the hatchet on that a long time ago, right? We're, sure did. we're good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was the start of a, of a relationship that has been, uh, from my point of view, just wonderful with this museum and with Kathy where we uh, work together on projects uh, to try to get the story straight, to try to get uh, information on the history of avalanches and avalanche safety and science in Canada. And one of the projects that we are involved with, well, a very visible project is the display downstairs in the museum right here. Uh, but online, we have an online virtual museum exhibit. And if uh, any of you want to visit the online exhibit, there's cards with the, the website on it right here. And that, it's a full history of uh, avalanche um, accidents and safety measures uh, for the whole country. Uh, Revelstoke uh, is sort of ground zero when it comes to the story of avalanches in Canada, which is both interesting and also a sad because of the loss of life. But one of the parts of the online exhibit is an up-to-date map showing where all the avalanche fatalities have happened in Canada uh, that we have records of. And there's undoubtedly some that we don't have records. So this map, we keep updated. Um, so this is updated right to the end of uh, 2019, and there will be some more to add here in the because of accidents in the last few, few months. Uh, but we have now detailed records and can map uh, 995 fatalities from across the country uh, in uh, 517 incidents. Now you can see here, look at where each mm -hmm. spot represents another incident. It's, it's just, th this is the center of gravity of where, in several ways, the use of that word, um, where this topic is highly relevant because of avalanche danger. It's surprising to some people though that there's avalanches and avalanche fatalities in other parts of Canada, such <coughs> as particularly Newfoundland. Um, often associated, uh, we, this, was, this accident was associated with a railway, um, but mines in the older days often had a very precarious locations for their, their various states. And uh, quite a few miners over the years have lost their lives to avalanches in the, at the mine sites. Um, in Newfoundland, uh, that was a common, common reason. Anyway, you can go on site and you can look at these, and if you just push a button, you can see all the ski touring accidents, the snowmobiling accidents, the miners, the road. That's all available through filters. Uh, now, uh, one of the things that's, I thought would be worth showing you, 10 years exactly uh, today ago, we uh, had a, uh, a ceremony recognizing the significance of the, of the 1910 slide and the people who lost their lives here in Revelstoke. And um, we're 10 years later, so I created another map that shows you these are the additional fatalities, 114 since we had that uh, centennial. 
So this isn't a was history topic, this is a is <laughs> uh, ongoing topic of history <laughs> over the years. Now one of the things that see most of them now are, have been, and you can get the details on the site, you can click on this button, it'll tell you the, the details, but one of the big changes in the last number of years is instead of railways and mines being the predominant and, and roads, uh, recreational deaths ski touring and snowmobiling. And snowmobiling is one of the big changes in the, that have happened in the last uh, few decades. So unfortunately, snowmobilers, this year it's sort of half and half. Uh, but there's been another six fatalities this year. And I think it's three and three. Uh, three snowmobilers and three backcountry skiers who've lost their lives. Okay. I just had uh, if John, if you wanted to talk maybe a bit more about sort of just to bring it up to date in terms of uh, avalanche control and so um, the avalanche control course uh, is world renowned here in in Revelstoke and it has its origins back well the whole issue of avalanche safety back in the 1880s when the railway had engineers out surveying the snow plotting where the avalanche paths were and decide, and recommending to the railway where to put the snowshoes. So that started right even before the, the tracks came through. Um, and then when they, in 19, the 1950s, when it was decided to put the, the, the highway over Rogers Pass, the railway had gone underneath through the Connaught Tunnel, so over, uh, the federal government uh, started to do very serious studies again uh, how, if they're going to go over Rogers Pass, how can they keep highway uh, users safe? So this is a, a, a picture from the very, uh, very early years of the, um, the most notable factor for most of the history of Rogers Pass avalanche control has been the use of, the, of a howitzer to bring down avalanches when nobody's underneath them. So the highway gets closed, the avalanches come down, they get gets cleared away and the highways reopen. And it's been a very, very successful program. So this is, let's see, where is this, Alan, exactly? Is this very close to? Shooting something on top of it. It looks like the 75, not the 105. This one looks like the 75, yeah. yeah. They used uh, two different calibers, but they found the, the, the 105 how it's to, to be better. But this is somewhere from uh, that location, actually, uh, from where the slide came down. Some of mine, yeah. Yeah, some of mine will be like framing the, that. I like the ear protection. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, it's lost. Yeah. That's what we're going to see. Yeah. Yeah. And that's Mount Tupper in the background. Okay. Uh, yeah, so now we're in, it's part of the, um, avalanche defense for the new highway, a series of snow sheds have been built. And they, uh, they haven't been uh, always the same configuration. So there was a configuration that was built when the highway was open in 62. And then over the years, experience has shown that some have been uh, abandoned, some of them joined, and a whole brand new one made. So yeah, there's no one figure that covers, like, there's five right now, right? But when I first moved here, there were four. For example, so as knowledge is gained and experience, these numbers of snow sheds and their locations can change. And it was the same for the railway. So whenever you're thinking about or trying to say there were so many sheds in Rogers Pass, well, it depends exactly what year you're talking about. But lots of snow. This is looking down out to the Beaver Valley from uh, the side of Mount Tupper. So you've all been to that spot too. Maybe not at that time of the year. Okay. Uh, this is the approach to Rogers Pass. So this, we're, we're out. There's some huge slide paths here. Um, this is a primary avalanche safety measure. Don't stop in places that have, have these signs on them. Uh, Mount Sir Donald up here. So you've just uh, entered uh, Glacier National Park and you're on the flats. And Rogers Pass curves up and through the mountains like that up there. Is there anything else you wanted to add about oh, before um, we go into the well, commemoration? Yeah, um, just just that um, 
avalanche uh, history, I guess all people who are involved in avalanche control and safety are archivists uh, to some extent and historians to some extent because uh, they have a knowledge of what has happened in the past is very instructive of what potential might happen in the future. And right now, uh, I think there's quite a transition happening in the past. There's all sorts of new techniques that are being employed. The gun was the primary technique for many years. So the gun had the advantage of remote firing. Now what I, uh, blind firing. So what I mean by that is they, uh, probably everyone see these round circles beside the highway. Well, those are gun positions. And if you put uh, a gun uh, like the howitzer on top of those positions and center it, and you angle that gun left to right a certain amount and you elevate it a certain amount and you shoot it, you can know over and over again, you can put a charge exactly to a spot in the mountains. Now what's important about that is you can do it day or night, storm or no storm, because you're using this reference system of a gun <coughs> position, uh, an aiming stake, and therefore Rogers Pass is, a tw is basically, the goal is to be open 24 hours and there's a potential to keep it open 24 hours because if the right time to shoot is in the night, they do it in the night. They, they can do it. Now, until very recently, what, a couple years now, Eagle Pass, if there needed to be explosives to bring down the avalanches, the only way to do it was to drop it out of a helicopter. And you don't do that at night. But now there is another, not a howitzer, but there's another system there. So more and more, it seems to me, uh, this, this operation is adjusting and making use of new technologies. So nowadays, there's one forecaster who can open his laptop and push buttons on his laptop with the highway closed and control certain areas of Rogers Pass while two, two or three, I don't know if there's anyone from the current avalanche system there, it keeps on, they keep on adding new techniques as they learn more. So the, um, now you might think, well, haven't they got it all figured out? One of the big variables that's changed over time is the n amount of traffic on this highway. And a program that worked when there's a thousand vehicles a day or a night um, doesn't necessarily work when there's 4,000. And that's l l literally in the time Marcy and I have been here, 1975 to now, the winter traffic has increased from around a thousand vehicles a day to 4,000 vehicles a day. So four times now, and I don't, and so they're having to constantly try to figure ways to have uh, multiple shoots, multiple controls, and, keep, and be able to reduce the time of the closure so that the traffic can keep flowing because where do you put it all if you, stop, if you close for avalanche? So it's uh, adapting, learning is uh, sort of ongoing part. So uh, it continues to be a world-class operation but of course now we have BC Highways who are doing similar similar things and uh, they share information quite freely. Yeah. So um, for 10 years ago today, in, uh, we uh, had a ceremony in Grizzly Plaza. There were probably about 800 people there mm -hmm. and we did a commemoration, a 100 year commemoration of the event. It was incredibly moving. Uh, there were representatives of families, uh, one of the families from Japan. Uh, there was, uh, we had a Buddhist ceremony there. Uh, the, the community choir was singing the songs, hymns that were sung at the original uh, memorial in town. It was just, uh, really felt uh, it was an important way to commemorate those individuals who had lost their lives. So we've got a, a short video that we're uh, going to, we can play. Uh, it's about five minutes long. We've also put it on our Facebook page. It's also linked in the Land of Thunder and Snow website. So if you do need to, to leave, that, that's fine. Uh, well, the video is about five minutes. But I did want to acknowledge to Tomo, uh, who really, uh, before then we didn't really know much about the, the Japanese people who had died. He really brought that out, element of it in. He actually went to Japan uh, to talk about the story, brought back, a uh, thousand miniature paper cranes that were folded by people in Japan and uh, he found relatives of I think at least five of the, the men and um, some of them came out in August when they had another ceremony as well 
So uh, that's really been an important part of this is sort of putting a human face on it and really remembering the people who were involved. Uh, before we do the, the uh, show, did anybody have any questions, especially for John? Or? Uh, you, you mentioned there were some newer techniques for bringing down avalanches, like the avalanche control. Mm -hmm. What are those? Uh, I probably can't give you a, a full listing, but one of them is called DASX, 